Chapter One of Literary Taste How to Form It by Arnold Bennett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Literary Taste How to Form It with detailed instructions for the collecting of a complete library of English literature by Arnold Bennett. Chapter 1. The Aim At the beginning a misconception must be removed from the path. Many people, if not most, look on literary taste as an elegant accomplishment, by acquiring which they will complete themselves and make themselves finally fit as members of a correct society. They are secretly ashamed of their ignorance of literature in the same way that they would be ashamed of their ignorance of etiquette at a high entertainment, or of their inability to ride a horse if suddenly called upon to do so. There are certain things that a man ought to know, or know about, and literature is one of them, such is their idea. They have learned to dress themselves with propriety, and behave with propriety on all occasions. They are fairly up in the questions of the day, by industry and enterprise they are succeeding in their vocations. It behooves them, then, not to forget that an acquaintance with literature is an indispensable part of a self-respecting man's personal baggage. Painting doesn't matter, music doesn't matter very much, but everyone is supposed to know about literature. Then, literature is such a charming distraction. Literary taste thus serves two purposes, as a certificate of correct culture and as a private pastime. A young professor of mathematics, immense at mathematics and games, dangerous at chess, capable of Hayden on the violin, once said to me, after listening to some chat on books, Yes, I must take up literature, as though saying, I was rather forgetting literature. However, I've polished off all these other things, I'll have a shy at literature now. This attitude, or any attitude which resembles it, is wrong. To him who really comprehends what literature is, and what the function of literature is, this attitude is simply ludicrous. It is also fatal to the formation of literary taste. People who regard literary taste simply as an accomplishment, and literature simply as a distraction, will never truly succeed either in acquiring the accomplishment or in using it half acquired as a distraction, though one is the most perfect of distractions and though the other is unsurpassed by any other accomplishment in elegance or in power to impress the universal snobbery of civilized mankind. Literature, instead of being an accessory, is the fundamental sine qua non of complete living. I am extremely anxious to avoid rhetorical exaggerations. I do not think I am guilty of one in asserting that he who has not been presented to the freedom of literature has not wakened up out of his prenatal sleep. He is merely not born. He can't see, he can't hear, he can't feel in any full sense. He can only eat his dinner. What, more than anything else, annoys people who know the true function of literature, and have profited thereby, is the spectacle of so many thousands of individuals going about under the delusion that they are alive, when, as a fact, they are no nearer being alive than a bear in winter. I will tell you what literature is. No, I wish I could, but I can't, no one can. Gleams can be thrown on the secret, inklings given, but no more. I will try to give you an inkling. And to do so, I will take you back into your own history, or forward into it. That evening, when you went for a walk with your faithful friend, the friend from whom you hid nothing, or almost nothing, you were, in truth, somewhat inclined to hide from him the particular matter which monopolized your mind that evening. But somehow you contrived to get on to it, drawn by an overpowering fascination, and, as your faithful friend was sympathetic and discreet and flattered you by a respectful courtesy, you proceeded further and further into the said matter, growing more and more confidential, until at last you cried out in a terrific whisper, "'My boy, she is simply miraculous!' At that moment, you were in the domain of literature. Let me explain. Of course, in the ordinary acceptation of the word, she, 
was not miraculous. Your faithful friend had never noticed that she was miraculous, nor had about forty thousand other fairly keen observers. She was just a girl. Troy had not been burned for her. A girl cannot be called a miracle. If a girl is to be called a miracle, then you might call pretty nearly anything a miracle. That is just it. You might. You can. You ought. Amid all the miracles of the universe, you had just wakened up to one. You were full of your discovery. You were under a divine impulsion to impart that discovery. You had a strong sense of the marvellous beauty of something, and you had to share it. You were in a passion about something, and you had to vent yourself on somebody. You were drawn toward the whole of the rest of the human race. Mark the effect of your mood and utterance on your faithful friend. He knew that she was not a miracle. No other person could have made him believe that she was a miracle, but you, by the force and sincerity of your own vision of her, and by the fervour of your desire to make him participate in your vision, did, for quite a long time, cause him to feel that he had been blind to the miracle of that girl. You were producing literature. You were alive. Your eyes were unlidded, your ears were unstopped to some part of the beauty and strangeness of the world, and a strong instinct within you forced you to tell someone. It was not enough for you that you saw and heard. Others had to see and hear. Others had to be wakened up, and they were. It is quite possible, I'm not quite sure, that your faithful friend, the very next day or the next month, looked at some other girl, and suddenly saw that she, too, was miraculous. The influence of literature. The makers of literature are those who have seen and felt the miraculous interestingness of the universe. And the greatest makers of literature are those whose vision has been the widest and whose feeling has been the most intense. Your own fragment of insight was accidental and perhaps temporary. Their lives are one long ecstasy of denying that the world is a dull place. Is it nothing to you to learn, to understand, that the world is not a dull place? Is it nothing to you to be led out of the tunnel, onto the hillside, to have all your senses quickened, to be invigorated by the true savour of life, to feel your heart beating under that correct necktie of yours? These makers of literature render you their equals. The aim of literary study is not to amuse the hours of leisure. It is to awake oneself. It is to be alive, to intensify one's capacity for pleasure, for sympathy, and for comprehension. It is not to affect one hour, but twenty-four hours. It is to change utterly one's relations with the world. An understanding appreciation of literature means an understanding appreciation of the world, and it means nothing else. Not isolated and unconnected parts of life, but all of life put together and correlated in a synthetic map. The spirit of literature is unifying. It joins the candle and the star, and by the magic of an image shows that the beauty of the greater is in the less, and, not content with the disclosure of beauty and the bringing together of all things whatever within its focus, it enforces a moral wisdom by the tracing everywhere of cause and effect. It consoles doubly by the revelation of unsuspected loveliness, and by the proof that our lot is the common lot. It is the supreme cry of the discoverer, offering sympathy and asking for it in a single gesture. In attending a university extension lecture on the sources of Shakespeare's plots, or in studying the researches of George Saintsbury into the origins of English prosody, or in weighing the evidence for and against the assertion that Rousseau was a scoundrel, one is apt to forget what literature really is and is for. It is well to remind ourselves that literature is first and last a means of life, and that the enterprise of forming one's literary taste is an enterprise of learning how best to use this means of life. People who don't want to live, people who would sooner hibernate than feel intensely, 
would be wise to eschew literature. They had better, to quote from the finest passage in a fine poem, sit around and eat blackberries. The sight of a common bush afire with God might upset their nerves. End of chapter 1of literary taste how to form it this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by timothy ferguson literary taste how to form it by arnold bennett chapter 2 your particular case the attitude of the average decent person toward the classics of his own tongue is one of distrust i had almost said of fear I will not take the case of Shakespeare, for Shakespeare is taught in schools. That is to say, the Board of Education and all authorities pedagogic bind themselves together in a determined effort to make every boy in the land a lifelong enemy of Shakespeare. It's a mercy they don't teach Blake. I will take, for an example, Sir Thomas Brown, as to whom the average person has no offensive juvenile memories. He is bound to have read somewhere that the style of Sir Thomas Brown is unsurpassed by anything in English literature. One day he sees the Religio Medici in a shop window, or rather, outside a shop window, for he would hesitate about entering a bookshop. And he buys it, by way of a mild experiment. He does not expect to be enchanted by it. A profound instinct tells him that Sir Thomas Brown is not in his line, and in the result he is even less enchanted than he expected to be he reads the introduction and he glances at the first page or two of the work he sees nothing but words the work makes no appeal to him whatever he is surrounded by trees and cannot perceive the forest he puts the book away if sir thomas brown is mentioned he will say yes very fine with a feeling of pride that he has at any rate bought and inspected sir thomas brown deep in his heart is a suspicion that the people who get enthusiastic about Sir Thomas Brown are vain and conceited posers. After a year or so, when he has recovered from the discouragement caused by Sir Thomas Brown, he may, if he is young and hopeful, repeat the experiment with Congreve or Addison. Same sequel, and so on perhaps for a decade, until his commerce with the classics finally expires. That, magazines and newish fiction apart, is the literary history of the average decent person. And even your case, though you are genuinely preoccupied with thoughts of literature, bears certain disturbing resemblances to the drab case of the average person. You do not approach the classics with gusto, anyhow not with the same gusto as you would approach a new novel by a modern author who had taken your fancy. You never murmured to yourself when reading Gibbon's Decline and Fall in Bed, Well, I really must read one more chapter before I go to sleep. Speaking generally, the classics do not afford you a pleasure commiserate with their renown. You peruse them with a sense of duty, a sense of doing the right thing, a sense of improving yourself, rather than a sense of gladness. You do not smack your lips, you say, This is good for me. You make little plans for reading, and then you invent excuses for breaking the plans. Something new, something which is not a classic, will surely draw you away from a classic. It is all very well for you to pretend to agree with the verdict of the elect that Clarissa Harlow is one of the greatest novels in the world. A new Kipling, or even a new number of a magazine, will cause you to neglect Clarissa Harlow, just as though Kipling, etc., could not be kept for a few days without turning sour so that you have to ordain rules for yourself, as I will not read anything else until I have read Richardson or Gibbon for an hour each day, thus proving that you regard a classic as a pill, the swallowing of which merits jam. And the more modern a classic is, the more it resembles the stuff of the year, and the less it resembles the classics of the centuries, the more easy and enticing do you find that classic. Hence you are glad that George Eliot, the Brontes, Thackeray, are considered as classics, because you really do enjoy them. Your sentiments concerning them approach your sentiments concerning a rattling good story in a magazine. I may have exaggerated, or, on the other hand, I may have understated, 
the unsatisfactory characteristics of your particular case but it is probable that in the mirror i hold up to you you recognize the rough outlines of your likeness you do not care to admit it but it is so you are not content with yourself the desire to be more truly literary persists in you you feel that there is something wrong in you but you cannot put your finger on the spot further you feel that you're a bit of a sham something within you continually forces you to exhibit for the classics an enthusiasm which you do not sincerely feel you even try to persuade yourself that you are enjoying a book when the next moment you drop it in the middle and forget to resume it you occasionally buy classical works and do not read them at all you practically decide that it is enough to possess them and that the mere possession of them gives you a cachet the truth is you are a sham and your soul is a sea of uneasy remorse you reflect according to what matthew arnold says i ought to be perfectly mad about wordsworth's prelude and i am not why am i not have i got to be learned to undertake a vast course of study in order to be perfectly mad about wordsworth's prelude or am i born without the faculty of pure taste in literature despite my vague longings i do wish i could smack my lips over wordsworth's prelude as i did over that splendid story by h g wells the country of the blind in the strand magazine yes i am convinced that in your dissatisfied your diviner moments you address yourself in these terms i am convinced that i have diagnosed your symptoms now the enterprise of forming one's literary taste is an agreeable one if it is not agreeable it cannot succeed but this does not imply that it is an easy or a brief one the enterprise of beating colonel bogeyed golf is an agreeable one but it means honest and regular work a fact to be borne in mind always you are certainly not going to realize your ambition and so great so influential an ambition by spasmodic and half-hearted effort you must begin by making up your mind adequately you must rise to the height of the affair you must approach a grand undertaking in a grand manner you ought to mark the day in your calendar as a solemnity human nature is weak and has need of tricky aids even in the pursuit of happiness time will be necessary to you and time regularly and sacredly set apart many people affirm that they cannot be regular that regularity numbs them i think this is true of very few people and that in the rest the objection to regularity is merely an attempt to excuse idleness i am inclined to think that you personally are capable of regularity and i am sure that if you firmly and constantly devote certain specific hours on certain specific days of the week to this business of forming your literary taste you will arrive at the goal much sooner the simple act of resolution will help you this is the first preliminary the second preliminary is to surround yourself with books to create for yourself a bookish atmosphere the merely physical side of books is important more important than it may seem to the inexperienced theoretically save for works of reference a student has need for but one book at a time theoretically an amateur of literature might develop his taste by expending sixpence a week or a penny a day in one sixpenny edition of a classic after another sixpenny edition of a classic and he might store his library in a hat-box or a biscuit tin but in practice he would have to be a monster of resolution to succeed in such conditions the eye must be flattered the hand must be flattered the sense of owning must be flattered sacrifices must be made for the acquisition of literature that which has cost a sacrifice is always endeared a detailed scheme of buying books will come later in the light of further knowledge for the present buy buy whatever has received the imprimatur of critical authority buy without any immediate reference to what you will read buy surround yourself with volumes as handsome as you can afford and for reading all that i will now particularly enjoin is a general and inclusive tasting in order to attain a sort of familiarity with the look of literature in all its branches a turning over of the pages of a volume of chambers cyclopedia of english literature 
the third for preference may be suggested as an admirable and diverting exercise you might mark the authors that flash an appeal to you end of chapter two chapter three of literary taste how to form it this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by timothy ferguson literary taste how to form it by arnold bennett chapter three why a classic is a classic the large majority of our fellow citizens care as much about literature as they care about aeroplanes or the program of the legislature they do not ignore it they are not quite indifferent to it but their interest in it is faint and perfunctory or if their interest happens to be violent it is spasmodic ask the two hundred thousand persons whose enthusiasm made the vogue of a popular novel ten years ago what they think of that novel now and you will gather that they have utterly forgotten it and that they would probably no more dream of reading it again than of reading bishop stubb's select charters probably if they did read it again they would not enjoy it not because the said novel is a whit worse now than it was ten years ago not because their taste has improved but because they have not had sufficient practice to be able to rely on their taste as a means of permanent pleasure they simply don't know from one day to the next what will please them in the face of this one may ask why does the great and universal fame of classical authors continue the answer is that the fame of classical authors is entirely independent of the majority do you suppose that if the fame of shakespeare depended on the man in the street it would survive a fortnight the fame of classical authors is originally made and is maintained by a passionate few even when a first-class author has enjoyed immense success during his lifetime the majority have never appreciated him so sincerely as they have appreciated second-rate men he has always been reinforced by the ardour of the passionate few and in the case of an author who has emerged into glory after his death the happy sequel has been due solely to the obstinate perseverance of the few they could not leave him alone they would not they kept on savouring him and talking about him and buying him and they generally behaved with such eager zeal and they were so authoritative and sure of themselves that at last the majority grew accustomed to the sound of his name and placidly agreed to the proposition that he was a genius the majority really did not care very much either way and it is by the passionate few that the renown of genius is kept alive from one generation to another these few are always at work they are always rediscovering genius their curiosity and enthusiasm are exhaustless so there is little chance of genius being ignored and moreover they are always working either for or against the verdicts of the majority the majority can make a reputation but it is too careless to maintain it if by accident the passionate few agree with the majority in a particular instance they will frequently remind the majority that such and such a reputation has been made and the majority will widely concur ah yes by the way we must not forget that such and such a reputation exists without that persistent memory jogging the reputation would quickly fall into the oblivion which is death the passionate few only have their way by reason of the fact that they are genuinely interested in literature that literature matters to them they conquer by their obstinacy alone by their eternal repetition of the same statements do you suppose they could prove to the man in the street that shakespeare was a great artist the said man would not even understand the terms they employed but when he is told ten thousand times and generation after generation that shakespeare was a great artist the said man believes not by reason but by faith and he too repeats that shakespeare was a great artist and he buys the complete works of shakespeare and he puts them on his shelves and he goes to see the marvellous stage effects which accompany king lear or hamlet and comes back religiously convinced that shakespeare was a great artist all because the passionate few could not keep their admiration of shakespeare to themselves this is not cynicism but truth and it is important that those who wish to form their literary taste should grasp it what causes the passionate few to make such a fuss about literature 
there can only be one reply. They find a keen and lasting pleasure in literature. They enjoy literature as some men enjoy beer. The recurrence of this pleasure naturally keeps their interest in literature very much alive. They are forever making new researches, forever practising on themselves. They learn to understand themselves. They learn to know what they want. Their taste becomes surer and surer as their experience lengthens. They do not enjoy today what will seem tedious to them tomorrow. When they find a book tedious, no amount of popular clatter will persuade them that it is pleasurable, and when they find it pleasurable, no chill silence of the street crowds will affect their conviction that the book is good and permanent. They have faith in themselves. What are the qualities in a book which give keen and lasting pleasure to the passionate few? This is a question so difficult that it has never yet been completely answered. You may talk lightly about truth, insight, knowledge, wisdom, humour, and beauty, but these comfortable words do not really carry you very far, for each of them has to be defined, especially the first and last. It's all very well for Keats, in his airy manner, to assert that beauty is truth, truth, beauty, and that is all he knows or needs to know. I, for one, need to know a lot more, and I never shall know. Nobody not even Hazlitt nor St. Beau, has finally explained why he thought a book beautiful. I take the first lines that come to hand. The woods of Arcady are dead, and over is their antique joy. And I say that those lines are beautiful because they give me pleasure. But why? No answer. I only know that the passionate few will, broadly, agree with me in deriving this mysterious pleasure from those lines. I am only convinced that the liveliness of our pleasure in those and many other lines by the same author will ultimately cause the majority to believe, by faith, that W. B. Yeats is a genius. The one reassuring aspect of the literary affair is that the passionate few are passionate about the same things. A continuance of interest does, in actual practice, lead ultimately to the same judgments. There is only the difference in width of interest. Some of the passionate few lack catholicity, or rather, the whole of their interest is confined to one narrow channel. They have none left over. These men help specially to vitalise the reputations of the narrower geniuses, such as Crashaw. But their active predilections never contradict the general verdict of the passionate few. Rather, they reinforce it. A classic is a work which gives pleasure to the minority which is intensely and permanently interested in literature. It lives on because the minority, eager to renew the sensation of pleasure, is eternally curious, and is therefore engaged in an eternal process of rediscovery. A classic does not survive for any ethical reason. It does not survive because it conforms to certain canons, or because neglect would kill it. It survives because it is a source of pleasure, and because the passionate few can no more neglect it than a bee can neglect a flower. The passionate few do not read the right things because they are right. That is to put the cart before the horse. The right things are the right things solely because the passionate few like reading them. Hence, and I now arrive at my point, the one primary essential to literary taste is a hot interest in literature. If you have that, all the rest will come. It matters nothing that at present you fail to find pleasure in certain classics. The driving impulse of your interest will force you to acquire experience, and experience will teach you the use of the means of pleasure. You do not know the secret ways of yourself. That is all. A continuance of interest must inevitably bring you to the keenest joys. But, of course, experience may be acquired judiciously or injudiciously just as Putney may be reached via Wallam Green or via St. Petersburg. End of chapter 3《Literary Taste — How to Form It》by Arnold Bennett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Ferguson Literary Taste How to Form It by Arnold Bennett 
Chapter 4. Where to Begin I wish particularly that my readers should not be intimidated by the apparent vastness and complexity of this enterprise of forming the literary taste. It is not so vast nor so complex as it looks. There is no need whatever for the inexperienced enthusiast to confuse and frighten himself with thoughts of literature in all its branches. Experts and pedagogues, chiefly pedagogues, have, for the purpose of convenience, split literature up into divisions and subdivisions, such as prose and poetry, or imaginative, philosophic, historical, or elegaic, heroic, lyrical, or religious and profane, etc., ad infinitum. But the greater truth is that literature is all one and indivisible. The idea of the unity of literature should be well planted and fostered in the head. All literature is the expression of feeling, of passion, of emotion, caused by a sensation of the interestingness of life. What drives a historian to write history? Nothing but the overwhelming impression made upon him by the survey of past times. He is forced into an attempt to reconstitute the picture for others. If hitherto you have failed to perceive that a historian is a being in strong emotion, trying to convey his emotion to others, read the passage in the memoirs of Gibbon in which he describes how he finished the decline and fall. You will probably never again look upon the decline and fall as a dry work. What applies to history applies to the other dry branches. Even Johnson's dictionary is packed with emotion. Read the last paragraph of the preface to it. Quote, in this work, where it shall be found that much is omitted, let it not be forgotten that much likewise is performed. It may repress the triumph of malignant criticism to observe that if our language is not here fully displayed, I have only failed in an attempt which no human powers have hitherto completed. End quote and so on to the close quote, i have protracted my work till most of those whom i wish to please have sunk into the grave and success and miscarriage are empty sounds i therefore dismiss it with frigid tranquillity having little to fear or hope from censure or from praise End quote. yes tranquillity but not frigid the whole passage, one of the finest in English prose, is marked by the heat of emotion. You may discover the same quality in such books as Spencer's First Principles. You may discover it everywhere in literature, from the cold fire of Pope's irony to the blasting temperatures of Swinburne. Literature does not begin till emotion has begun. There is even no essential definable difference between those two great branches prose and poetry for prose may have rhythm all that can be said is that verse will scan while prose will not the difference is purely formal very few poets have succeeded in being so poetical as isaiah sir thomas brown and ruskin have been in prose it can only be stated that as a rule writers have shown an instinctive tendency to choose verse for the expression of the very highest emotion the supreme literature is in verse, but the finest achievements in prose approach so nearly to the finest achievements in verse that it is ill work deciding between them. In the sense in which poetry is best understood, all literature is poetry, or is at any rate poetical in quality. Macaulay's ill-informed and unjust denunciations live because his genuine emotion made them into poetry while his lays of ancient Rome are dead, because they are not the expression of a genuine emotion. As the literary taste develops, this quality of emotion, restrained or loosed, will be more and more widely perceived at large in literature. It is the quality that must be looked for. It is the quality that unifies literature and all the arts. It is not merely useless, it is harmful, for you, to map out literature into divisions and branches with different laws, rules, or canons. 
The first thing is to obtain some possession of literature, when you have actually felt some of the emotion which great writers have striven to impart to you, and when your emotions become so numerous and puzzling that you feel the need of arranging them and calling them by names then and not before, you can begin to study what has been attempted in the way of classifying and ticketing literature. Manuals and treaties are excellent things in their kind, but they are simply dead weight at the start. You can only acquire really useful general ideas by first acquiring particular ideas, and putting those particular ideas together. You cannot make bricks without straw. Do not worry about literature in the abstract, about theories as to literature. Get at it. Get hold of literature in the concrete, as a dog gets hold of a bone. If you were to ask me where you ought to begin, I shall gaze at you as I might gaze at the faithful animal if he inquired which end of the bone he ought to attack. It doesn't matter in the slightest degree where you begin. Begin wherever the fancy takes you to begin. Literature is a whole. There is only one restriction for you. You must begin with an acknowledged classic. You must assume modern works. The reason for this does not imply any depreciation of the present age at the expense of past ages. Indeed, it is important, if you wish ultimately to have a wide Catholic taste, to guard against the too common assumption that nothing modern will stand comparison with the classics. In every age there have been people to sigh, Ah, yes, fifty years ago we had a few great writers, but they are all dead and no young ones are arising to take their place. This attitude of mind is deplorable, if not silly, and is a certain proof of narrow taste. It is a surety that in 1959 gloomy and egregious persons will be saying, Ah, yes, at the beginning of the century there were great poets like Swinburne, Meredith, Francis Thompson and Yeats, great novelists like Hardy and Conrad, great historians like Stubbs and Maitland, etc., etc. But they are all dead now, and whom have we to take their place? It is not until an age has receded into history, and all of its mediocrity has dropped away from it, that we can see it as it is, as a group of men of genius. We forget the immense amount of twaddle that the great epochs produced. The amount of fine literature created in a given period of time differs from epoch to epoch, but it does not differ much. And we may be perfectly sure that our own age will make a favourable impression upon that excellent judge, posterity. Therefore, beware of disparaging the present in your own mind, while temporarily ignoring it, dwell upon the idea that its chaff contains about as much wheat as any similar quantity of chaff has contained wheat. The reason why you must avoid modern works at the beginning is simply that you are not in a position to choose among modern works. Nobody at all is quite in a position to choose with certainty among modern works. To sift the wheat from the chaff is a process that takes an exceedingly long time. Modern works have to pass before the bar of the taste of successive generations, whereas with classics, which have been through the ordeal, almost the reverse is true. Your taste has to pass before the bar of the classics. That is the point. If you differ with a classic, it is you who are wrong and not the book. If you differ with a modern work, you may be wrong or you may be right, but no judge is authoritative enough to decide. Your taste is unformed. It needs guidance, and it needs authoritative guidance. Into the business of forming literary taste, faith enters. You probably will not specially care for a particular classic at first. If you did care for it at first, your taste, so far as that classic is concerned, would be formed, and our hypothesis is that your taste is not formed. How are you to arrive at the stage of caring for it? Chiefly, of course, by examining it and honestly trying to understand it. But this process is materially helped by an act of faith, by the frame of mind which says, I know, on the highest authority, that this thing is fine, that it is capable of giving me pleasure, hence 
I am determined to find pleasure in it. Believe me that faith counts enormously in the development of that wide taste which is the instrument of wide pleasures. But it must be faith founded on unassailable authority. End of chapter 4 Recording by Timothy Ferguson Gold Coast, Australia Five of Literary Taste How to Form It by Arnold Bennett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Literary Taste How to Form It by Arnold Bennett. Chapter 5. How to Read a Classic Let us begin experimental reading with Charles Lamb. I choose Lamb for various reasons. He is a great writer, wide in his appeal, of a highly sympathetic temperament, and his finest achievements are simple and very short. Moreover, he may usefully lead to other and more complex matters, as will appear later. Now, your natural tendency will be to think of Charles Lamb as a book, because he has arrived at the stage of being a classic. Charles Lamb was a man, not a book. It is extremely important that the beginner in literary study should always form an idea of the man behind the book. The book is nothing but the expression of the man. The book is nothing but the man trying to talk to you, trying to impart to you some of his feelings. An experienced student will divine the man from the book, will understand the man by the book, as is of course logically proper. But the beginner will do well to aid himself in understanding the book by means of independent information about the man. He will thus at once relate the book to something human, and strengthen in his mind the essential notion of the connection between literature and life. The earliest literature was delivered orally, direct by the artist to the recipient. In some respects, this arrangement was ideal. Changes in the constitution of society have rendered it impossible. Nevertheless, we can still, by the exercise of the imagination, hear mentally the accents of the artist speaking to us. We must so exercise our imagination as to feel the man behind the book. Some biographical information about Lamb should be acquired. There are excellent short biographies of him by Canon Anger in the Dictionary of National Biography, in Chambers' Encyclopedia, and in Chambers' Cyclopedia of English Literature. If you have none of these, but you ought to have the last, there are Mr. E. V. Lucas's exhaustive Life by Matthew and Seven Shillings and Sixpence, and cheaper. Mr. Walter Gerald's Lamb, Bell and Sons, one shilling. Also, introductory studies prefixed to the various editions of Lamb's works. Indeed, the facilities for collecting materials for a picture of Charles Lamb as a human being are prodigious. When you have made for yourself such a picture, read The Essays of Ilia, The Light of It. I will choose one of the most celebrated dream children a reverie at this point kindly put my book down and read dream children do not say to yourself that you will read it later but read it now when you have read it you may proceed to my next paragraph you are to consider dream children as a human document lamb was nearing fifty when he wrote it you can see especially from the last line that the death of his elder brother, John Lamb, was fresh and heavy on his mind. You will recollect that in youth he had a disappointing love affair with a girl named Anne Simmons, who afterwards married a man named Bartram. 
you will know that one of the influences of his childhood was his grandmother, Field, housekeeper of Blake's Warehouse in Hertfordshire, at which mansion he sometimes spent his holidays. You will know that he was a bachelor, living with his sister Mary, who was subject to homicidal mania. And you will see in this essay, primarily, a supreme expression of the increasing loneliness of his life. He constructed all that preliminary tableau of paternal pleasure in order to bring home to you, in the most poignant way, his feeling of the solitude of his existence, his sense of all that he had missed and lost in the world. The key of the essay is one of profound sadness. But note that he makes his sadness beautiful, or rather, he shows the beauty that resides in sadness. You watch him sitting there in his bachelor armchair, and you say to yourself, Yes, it was sad, but it was somehow beautiful. When you have said that to yourself, Charles Lamb, so far as you are concerned, has accomplished his chief aim in writing the essay. How exactly he produces his effect can never be fully explained. But one reason for his success is certainly his regard for truth. He does not falsely idealize his brother, nor the relations between them. He does not say, as a sentimentalist would have said, not the slightest cloud ever darkened our relations, nor does he exaggerate his solitude. Being a sane man, he has too much common sense to assemble all his woes at once. He might have told you that Bridget was a homicidal maniac, what he does tell you is that she was faithful. Another reason for his success is his continual regard for beautiful things and fine actions, as illustrated in the major characteristics of his grandmother and his brother, and in the detailed description of Blake's warehouse and the gardens thereof. Then, subordinate to the main purpose, part of the machinery of the main purpose, is the picture of the children. Real children, until the moment when they fade away. The traits of childhood are accurately and humorously put in again and again. Quote, Here John smiled as much to say that would be foolish indeed. Here little Alice spread her hands. Here Alice's little right foot played an involuntary movement till, upon my looking grave, it desisted. Here John expanded all his eyebrows and tried to look courageous. Here John slyly deposited back upon the plate a bunch of grapes. Here the children fell a-crying, and prayed me to tell them some stories about their pretty dead mother. And the exquisite, Here Alice put out one of her dear mother's looks, too tender to be a braiding. Incidentally, while preparing his ultimate solemn effect, Lamb has inspired you with a new, intensified vision of the wistful beauty of children their imitativeness, their facile and generous emotions, their anxiety to be correct, their ingenious haste to escape from grief to joy. You can see these children almost as clearly and as tenderly as Lamb saw them. For days afterwards, you will not be able to look upon a child without recalling Lamb's portrayal of the grace of childhood. He will have shared with you his perception of beauty. If you possess children... He will have renewed for you the charm which custom does very decidedly stale. It is further to be noticed that the measure of his success in picturing the children is the measure of his success in his main effect. The more real they seem, the more touching is the revelation of the fact that they do not exist, and never have existed. And if you are moved by the reference to their pretty dead mother, you will be still more moved when you learn that the girl who would have been their mother, is not dead, and is not Lamb's. As having read the essay, you reflect upon it, you will see how its emotional power of you has sprung from the sincere and unexaggerated expression of actual emotions exactly remembered by someone who had an eye always open for beauty, who was, indeed, obsessed by beauty, the beauty of old houses and gardens and aged virtuous characters, the beauty of children, the beauty of companionships, the softening beauty of dreams in an armchair. All these things were brought together and mingled with grief and regret, which were the origin of the mood. 
Why is Dream Children a classic? It is a classic because it transmits to you, as to generations before you, distinguished emotion, because it makes you respond to the throb of life more intensely, more justly, and more nobly. It is capable of doing this because Charles Lamb had a very distinguished, a very sensitive, and a very honest mind. His emotions were noble. He felt so keenly that he was obliged to find relief in imparting his emotions, and his mental processes were so sincere that he could neither exaggerate nor diminish the truth. If he had lacked any one of these three qualities, his appeal would have been narrowed and weakened, and he would not have become a classic. Either his feelings would have been deficient in supreme beauty, and therefore less worthy to be imparted, or he would not have had sufficient force to impart them, or his honesty would not have been equal to the strain of imparting them accurately. In any case, in any case, he would not have set up in you that vibration which we call pleasure, and which is supereminently caused by vitalizing participation in high emotion. As Lamb sat in his bachelor armchair, with his brother in the grave and the faithful homicidal maniac by his side, he really did think to himself, This is beautiful. Sorrow is beautiful. Disappointment is beautiful. Life is beautiful. I must tell them. I must make them understand. Because he still makes you understand. He is a classic. And now I hear you say, But what about Lamb's famous literary style? Where does that come in? End of chapter 5 Reading by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia